G'day everyone. So today we're going to talk about the Dirac equation. And in this lecture, we will discuss how the Dirac equation was designed, uh, what the properties of the Dirac matrices that go into the equation are, um, what is the standard representation of the Dirac matrices, and we will see how the four current uh, leads to a lovely positive definite density, which uh, was a huge advantage of the Dirac equation at the time. At the time. Um, so let's get started. So Dirac was searching for a relativistic covariant wave equation, uh, which had the same form as the Schrodinger equation, I d psi dt equals h psi. Uh, and he wanted it to have a positive definite probability density. And that's because at the time, the charge density interpretation of the Klein-Gordon equation was not known. And the pi plus, pi minus mesons, in other words, charge spin zero particles had not yet been discovered. So in our ahistorical rendition of the Dirac equation, uh, we're going to start with the covariant form, which we want. We want to be manifestly covariant. I have no idea whether this is how Dirac came to this equation or not. But if we start with a manifestly covariant, and this m is just a constant, it will turn out to be the mass, of course, but let's, for now it's just a constant and it's a, it's a scalar constant. So we want this. We want a, some kind of manifestly covariant form. And if I write it like this, then I can immediately see that this, if it was possible, would allow me to write I gamma naught, whatever gamma naught is, d psi by dt, is equal to I gamma dot grad plus M psi. So in that case, it would satisfy the Schrodinger-like uh, equation and the constants are M and all the gammas. Okay, so the other thing that we want is for this equation to contain the connect to uh, contain the correct energy eigenvalues for free particles. Which we know from relativity is E squared equals P squared plus M squared. So if we take that uh, equation that we want, I gamma mu d mu minus m phi equals zero, psi equals zero, rather, and we multiply it, multiply our favorite equation by minus I gamma, oops, just to make sure I have a different set of dummy indices here, so I use nu instead of mu, so multiply it by this on the left. And so I get minus I D, oops, minus I you see where this is going in a second.
if I expand that out, I get something that looks like this. And the point is that the mu and the nu here and here are just dummy constants. So in fact, uh, these two terms exactly cancel each other out, which is by design, obviously. So these cancel out. And so that means that I get gamma nu d nu, gamma mu d mu, that should be mu. plus m squared psi equals zero. And if I look at this part here, I would say that somehow this should be this should be uh, p squared minus e squared, right? Because then I'll recover my correct eigenvalues according to the relativistic formula. And p squared minus e squared is nothing but d mu d mu, right? And you can just expand that one out. We've done that a lot with the Klein-Gordon equation already. So that would require... that gamma nu, gamma mu, I'm just swapping these two terms, should be equal to d mu d mu, which it would be if we write that as g mu nu d nu, d mu, right? So this is another way of writing the same, um, another way of writing d mu, d mu. And so, uh, and so this is true. Uh, if this is true, then we're going to have the correct eigenvalues. And so what we can then do is write this uh, requirement as a symmetrized version. So we reverse the dummy indices nu and mu, and then we can then see straight away that we'll have one half of gamma mu gamma nu plus gamma nu gamma mu is equal to, in other words, this is the anti-commutation relationships for this, these constants. And that has to equal g mu nu. So this is just an anti-symmetrized version of the same requirement that we had before. Uh, sorry, a symmetrized version of the same requirement that we had before. And so what does that mean? That means we require that the constant gamma naught squared is equal to one, that all the other gamma i's squared are equal to minus one. And if mu is not equal to nu, then gamma mu gamma nu is equal to minus gamma nu gamma mu. They, anti-commute if mu is not equal to nu. So that's my requirements on these gamma constants. And so, so the gammas are not, are not C numbers, right? They're just, they're not regular numbers. They have to be matrices. Not complex numbers. Um, in fact, they are matrices. Or at least they can be represented as matrices. All right?
The next property we need is to show that the gammas are traceless. And we can do that just using these three fundamental properties that we have at the top of the screen now. Uh, gamma naught squared equals one, gamma i squared equals minus one, and gamma mu gamma nu equals minus gamma nu gamma mu. So let's see how that works. Firstly, we can write down that the trace of gamma mu gamma nu is equal to the trace of gamma nu gamma mu. Why do I know that? It's because that's just a property of trace. If I have two matrices, A and B, then the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA, and that's true for all cyclic permutations when I have a trace of uh, multiple things. But I also know from the equation above that gamma mu gamma nu is equal to minus gamma nu gamma mu, so I can write this one as minus the trace of gamma nu gamma mu. And therefore, well, that's actually all I need for now. I mean, that shows us that gamma nu gamma mu, the multiplication of the two is traceless um, because the only way for this thing to be satisfied is for that trace to be equal to zero. But let's see what happens now if I take the trace of, say, one of the gamma i's. Or just actually, you know what? Trace of gamma mu. Trace of gamma mu. No, it's one of the i's. Take trace of gamma i. And I can multiply this. I can write this as gamma naught, gamma naught, gamma i. Because gamma naught, gamma naught is just one. As you can see here at the top. Gamma naught squared equals one. So I can just put a little one into that equation, like so. Now I can make a cyclic permutation. The cyclic permutation is gamma naught, gamma i, gamma naught. And now I'm going to swap these two. I know that they anti-commute because i is not equal to zero. So that's minus the trace of gamma naught, gamma naught, gamma i which is minus the trace of gamma i because, again, gamma naught, gamma naught is just 1. And so trace of gamma i equals minus the trace of gamma i, so obviously it means that the trace of gamma i is equal to 0. And you can do the same for gamma naught just to show that that one's also 0. Okay, so they're traceless. Uh, so what? Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the Schrodinger-like equation because that's where we want to go eventually anyway, right? So let's actually go there now. We're going to keep developing properties of this Dirac equation. Okay, so I can write my Dirac equation now as I divide psi dt equals h psi where h psi is equal to i gamma naught gamma i di plus gamma naught m times psi. So all I've done is I've taken this equation which is at the top here, i gamma naught d psi dt equals i d psi, i gamma i D, D i plus m, and I multiply it on the left by gamma naught to get that equation. And because I multiplied on the left by gamma naught, I can now just express i d i in terms of the momentum. Let's go uh, gamma naught, gamma i, p i plus gamma naught m. And let me write that as alpha i p i plus beta m, where 
obviously you can see I've just made some definitions. Alpha i is defined as being gamma naught, gamma i, and beta is defined as being gamma naught. I still haven't said what the gammas are, but now I've already defined this alpha and betas in terms of them. And alpha i and beta, so beta is just gamma naught, so beta squared equals one, uh, just like gamma naught squared equals one. But if we look at the alpha i squared, we get beta gamma i, beta gamma i equals now I can take a I think it's, it's probably bad practice writing gammas and betas in the same equation. So anyway, I anti commute the first two according to the rules equals minus gamma i beta squared gamma i and that's equal to minus gamma i squared but we already talked that we already learnt that gamma i squared is equal to minus one so this is minus minus one which is equals plus one so alpha squared is equal to plus one not minus one for each one of those matrices um so how's this going to work right so we've got these matrices gammas gamma naught and gamma i or betas and alphas and we know that they're matrices um, because they have to obey certain commutation relationship, anti-commutation relationships. Um, and we know that they're traceless. So this equation, this Dirac equation that we have, uh, implies that um, this wave function is a vector. So we know that psi is actually a vector, which is looks like this it's similar to the two dimensional matrix that uh sorry the two dimensional vector that we had for the klein gordon equation in the um two component formalism um we know that this is going to be a vector of dimension n and alpha and beta are going to be n by n matrices yeah so alpha and beta are n by n matrices Okay, um, what are the eigenvalues of these alpha and beta? Let's have a look. So eigenvalues um, the eigenvalues are such that alpha times some each one, this is for, for, for each one of the alphas Let's, let's say alpha i times some vector is equal to lambda times that vector. And we can do a similarity transformation on, uh, on alpha in order to diagonalize it. So we know that there exists some similar trans similarity transformation u such that u yeah and we do the same transformation to the vector v right nothing controversial yet then in this representation This is just a long winded way of saying that the uh, trace is the sum of the uh, eigenvalues. In this representation, we know that u alpha i u to the minus one is equal to lambda one, lambda two, because that's what diagonalization means, right? Um, but we also know that but we also know that alpha i squared equals one, right? And that means that 
u alpha i u to the minus 1 squared is just u which is the same you know it's it's ah it's the same thing as u alpha i u to the minus 1 times u alpha i u to the minus 1 right if you take this then you can track along these guys that's 1 and then you go alpha i's and so you get this one is equal to 1 as well yeah because alpha i squared equals 1 so that's one, and then these guys, that one and that one come together, and that's one, and then this one and this one, that's one again. Yeah, so it's just one, 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 one. So in the representation that I'm interested in, don't need all these guys. In the representation I'm interested in, which is the one that I've just written down, I've got lambda one, lambda two, dot, dot, dot. That shouldn't have a u there. My apologies. Is that thing squared, which is just lambda 1 squared, lambda 2 squared, dot, dot, dot. Yeah? And that means that, therefore, each of the eigenvalues lambda k is either plus or minus 1 because when I square it I have to get 1 yeah so this thing here equals 1 i.e. the identity matrix or dimension n maybe I should actually put the identity i i yeah so this says that each one of the eigenvalues is either plus 1 or minus 1 but The trace of alpha i equals zero, and the trace is also equal to the sum of all of the eigenvalues. Therefore, there must be even numbers of each. There must be n over two eigenvalues plus 1, and n over 2 eigenvalues minus 1, oh. minus 1, and therefore n is even, because otherwise n over 2 is not a round number. So n is even. And each one of my matrices has uh, the same n number of positive one eigenvalues and minus one eigen eigenvalues. And you can do the same trick for the beta. Okay, what else? Uh, we need four such matrices. Yeah? I need alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and beta. So I need four of these matrices. Um, and I need four anti-commuting matrices. So if I had two by two matrices, it's not enough. N equals two is not enough. Why? Because three Pauli matrices span the two by two space. I should also mention that they only span the space with the identity matrix. But yeah, that I mean, obviously nothing anti-commutes with the identity matrix. Um, so anyway, so we don't have enough space in the two by two matrices. So we try the next smallest even number, n equals four. 
And uh, that's going to work, by the way. Um, moreover, and this is important, we want H to be Hermitian. Right, that's just a property we like from our uh, non-relativistic uh, mechanic, quantum mechanics. Um, so if H is Hermitian, that means we want alpha and beta to be Hermitian as well. And if alpha is Hermitian, and beta is Hermitian, that means that the gamma i is anti-Hermitian. And the proof of that is you just take gamma i, and you take the Hermitian conjugate of it, and that's equal to beta alpha i by definition, complex conjugate of that, and that's equal to, I uh, gotta get the right way around, you get alpha i cross beta cross, which is equal to alpha i beta, because those two are permission. And then we can go back into the gamma representation. So alpha i is just gamma naught, gamma i. Beta is gamma naught. And then I can anti-commute the two of those. For example, I can, I don't know, anti-commute the second two. But gamma naught, gamma naught equals 1. And so this is equal to minus gamma i. Right, so you can see that the gamma i's anti-commute. Okay. Next. So that's actually all of the properties that we need for the Dirac uh, equation. It's all the properties. Again, the Dirac equation, let's just recap where we're coming from. Try not to get dizzy while I do this. We want something that looks like this. And all we had to do was find the gamma noughts and the gamma i's. And then once we've done that, we get a nice representation, which is this one here. Yeah, that looks very much like the Schrodinger equation where alpha and beta are Hermitian. And so we have all of the properties we need for our Dirac equation. So we're gonna explore that at length over the next few lessons. Okay. Uh, so this is the standard representation. So once we've got our properties, there are many ways of representing those matrices and so the standard representation is alpha i is 0 gamma i gamma i 0 and beta is 1 0 0 minus 1 that's the standard representation um, the point is that there are many in fact, there's an infinite number of representations. Some of them are actually useful. So there are, there are several that, you know, different problems lead you to different representations. Um, here's the point. If I take 
any alpha prime and beta prime um, defined defined by alpha i prime oops equals some similarity transform on the alpha unitary transformation on the beta then that's also good it works the same way and it works because they can serve the commutation relationship And that's a good homework problem is just to show that the uh, commutation relationships on the gammas are conserved under such similarity transformations. Um, one of the things that I want to point out here, and I'm probably going to delete this um, in the final version of the notes because I can't think of a way of making this look nice. But when I look at this alpha i and beta at the top here, what I have actually written here is uh, two by two matrices. And you might be thinking, wait a second, you just said that these are supposed to be four by four matrices. These are four by four matrices. The, the, when I've written one and minus one, I actually meant I and minus I. So what I actually meant is beta is equal to one, one, minus one, minus one. And I meant alpha, I don't know, alpha one is equal to zero, 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 wait a second, zero, sigma i. Uh, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 zero. That's what I actually meant. And why have I written it as a two by two matrix? It's because when I do the ma matrix multiplication, I can do these four by four matrix, right? So if we've got four by four matrix, but it's broken up into this kind of two by two form, Right, and then if I want to multiply two such matrices, right, each one of these A, B, C, D, etc., they're all two by two matrices. It turns out that I can actually just do that as a two by two matrix like this. So this will, this corner will be A, B plus, oops, not my bad. So this corner up here will be a f plus b h and the next one's going to be you know c f plus d h and so on uh you know and so you can do it in this kind of two by two matrix way so you kind of you end up splitting your your four by four matrix like this and then you just treat each one of those separately and then if you have to of course then you can do this two by two matrix like you know, in detail, but sometimes you don't need to. So that's why we kind of do it in this way. All right. So I think, I can't think of a, a, a nice way of writing that. So I'm going to just delete this because it looks gross in my notes. So next, we're going to talk about the um, the four current. And we're going to do it the same way we always do it. So we write down the Dirac equation. I D I D T oops is equal to 
alpha dot p plus beta m phi. Yeah? And then we need to multiply it on the left by Psi cross Remember, Psi cross is like the complex the complex conjugate but you also go from like a column vector to a to a, a row vector um, alpha dot P plus beta M All right and then we need the complex conjugate of that equation so we'll write that as minus i d phi cross dt yeah is equal to minus alpha dot p because the complex conjugate of um of p is minus p um plus beta m dagger and again we multiply that one uh, by psi on the right this time so we can take that one and multiply it by psi on this side and psi on this side and then we subtract the two equations and we'll see that we get i ddt of psi cross psi so that's The first equation minus the second equation is equal to. Uh, it's good to just make sure that we understand what's going on with these alpha dot p's and so on. So let's write that in full. Sum over i. First equation. Alpha i. Minus i. D phi by dx i. And. The second equation that's the derivative of psi cross. Yeah. And obviously the beta part cancels out entirely. And so this is equal to minus i grad phi cross alpha grad psi and so this uh, looks very much like a um, a conserved current if we write it like dp dt plus grad dot j equal to zero um, then we see well, firstly, that the density rho is just phi cross psi, which is which is positive definite. Yay! That was the whole point, right? And we get J is equal to psi cross alpha psi okay so we've got a conserved current and we have a positive definite density so things are looking good for the Dirac equation next we should define the four current so what we're going to do is this is similar to what we did with the uh, two-component Klein-Gordon equation. We define this one as psi cross times gamma naught, or oops, my gosh, psi cross beta. Um, depends which whether we're using the alpha and the beta or the or the gamma naught. So again, it just depends what kind of problem you're trying to solve as to which one you want. And then the conserved current is J mu is equal to psi bar gamma mu psi. 
and d mu j mu is zero, right? So this is um this is pretty much what we want. Uh, everything's looking very good. So in fact, we can get a bit of insight into this equation if we have a look at the Dirac equation again. We can learn something about this this current and, and what it's conserving. So we start by writing the Dirac equation, gamma mu p mu minus m psi equals zero. Uh, we take the adjoint of this equation, right? So that's the um, the the conjugate, right? So so we'll, we'll take psi cross and that's going to be gamma mu p mu so now these are the adjoint versions oops that one should be again that should be adjoint not gamma mu cross p mu star minus m oops i don't want that one either equals zero so that's the adjoint of the equation and now I'm going to insert gamma naught squared, which I remember is just one. P mu star minus m equals zero. And now I'm going to take one of these gamma noughts and I'm going to put it with the psi cross to get psi bar. And the other one is going to go over here into these brackets. So this one's going to be um, gamma naught, gamma mu cross p mu star minus m gamma naught equals zero. And then I want to, oh, and gamma naught equals gamma naught squared, so I can actually just take that through like so I'll get gamma mu gamma naught cross p mu star minus m gamma naught equals zero. Um, and then I want to write that as this one is minus gamma mu. Oh, that was, that's all point minus p mu minus m psi naught equals zero and right so that's a that's means that psi bar So that's the adjoint of the equation. You can see it just looks exactly the same as the original, except now it's psi bar on the left instead of psi on the right. Um, so using that, we can then work out that uh, j mu, which is equal to psi bar gamma mu psi, which is half of psi bar gamma mu psi plus psi bar. So I'm basically splitting it up so I apply it onto the left and apply it onto the right. Like so. Um, and then I can replace psi bar gamma naught gamma mu, I want that one to stay the same. And then this psi, I use my original Klein-Gordon equation here, which says that m psi equals gamma mu, gamma, gamma mu p mu psi. So I can then write this one as just, I'm just using different dummy indices here. And for psi bar, I can do the same trick. Which 
because of what I've just proved. So, um, and so that's equal to one over two m psi bar gamma mu gamma nu plus gamma nu gamma mu. This looks so familiar, doesn't it? P nu psi. Um, and that's nothing but 2g mu nu, as we found out before, p nu psi, which equals psi bar p mu over m psi. So that's actually quite useful, because now if I take a plane wave, I do like the plane waves, don't I? Psi goes as e to the i, p dot r minus e t, usual ansatz. Then I substitute it in and I get j naught is equal to the density is e over m psi bar psi, right? And psi bar psi, that's, just to remind us, right, that's, that's, that's going to be E over M psi cross, yeah, and then there's um, gamma naught, which is beta and psi, and beta is like, beta is like one minus one, yeah, that's what's in beta. So if we pull all that together, we're going to get E over M. It's like the, the upper component. Upper component. Lower component. No, upper component. Upper component. Right? Just like this. Minus. Side down. Oh my gosh, like, like so, yeah? Um, I remember we also just wrote it as psi cross psi, yeah? So that means that somehow this E over M is positive for these guys and negative for these guys. Oh my gosh, it's like happening all over again. So, um, yeah, this is... This is the insightful thing. So basically what we're finding out here is that we're getting back into antiparticles. Um, of course, we're going to prove that more carefully next time. Meantime, we've got J equals P over M. P is the momentum. It's using the same plane wave solution. Um, times psi bar psi. Yeah. And so again, uh, we're going to have P over M times up. I just mean the upper two components. And down is the lower two. That's all. So we can see that we have a different sign in E and P for the upper and the lower components again. So something is getting funky here. So we have a, a different relative sign for the upper and lower components. Um, and maybe we'll, leave, we'll get, leave that for the next video. Okay, let's stop there.